Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On a lovely Monday morning here in Brussels, I want to welcome you to today's Europe at Debate event. My name is Yannis Emanoulidis, and together with Anna, we will be moderating today's event, um, uh, which we are co-organizing with uh, Future Lab, which is an initiative of uh, 10 foundations and the European Policy Center, which is operating this project. Um, the subject we want to deal with today is um, missing a generation EU politics, how to involve young Europeans. If you look at the topic, I think there is good reason and it's very timely to do so at this point in time. Let me just mention briefly three of them. The most obvious is the crisis, the crisis and its effects, the effects which it has had not, not only on all of us, but especially on the young generation and many EU member states, with challenges, wide challenges, many challenges, uh, which are not only financial, economic, but they're also social and political. Um, the worst of the crisis in systemic terms might be behind us. Let's hope that this is the case. Um, but we're still confronted with the multi multiple collateral damages which this crisis has produced. And the young generation, especially in some member states, stronger hit by the crisis, but also in general, are strongly affected by these collateral damages of the crisis. The most obvious effect we all talk and hear about is youth unemployment, but it's more than that. And if you talk to young Europeans throughout Europe, um, you often hear the sense of despair, frustration, sometimes even anger, and also what I would call nihilism, a kind of uh, asking oneself, uh, does it really make a difference if I do certain things? Will it change my future? Does it really make a sense to go and vote? Uh, will it change if I cast my vote in the ballot at European, national, whatever level? So you hear these things um, and you kind of have a negative socialization effect of the crisis. The early, those who are in their early 20s have lived through a long period of crisis. They have been socialized through this crisis, which obviously has effects on the younger generation. And I think that's one key reason why there's a need to think about their involvement, about what they think should be done, should happen at European level. A second reason is the elections. The elections in May of this year, which is an opportunity. An opportunity to uh, discuss things, to put forward ideas, proposals, to have interaction with political parties at national and European level, uh, and to provide uh, and to discuss priorities, orientations for the future of the EU. Um, because after the May elections, we will not only have a new European Parliament, but we will also get a new Commission President, a new Commission, a new uh, President of the European Parliament, maybe even a, um, Euro a President of the European of the Eurogroup, who will be a full-time president, a new high representative. So the entire EU leadership team will change. And that leads me to the third reason why I think it is timely to discuss what we will dis be discussing today, which is um, the fact that important decisions will be taken in the next upcoming period. There's a lot of uncertainty out there with respect to how in which direction the EU will be moving. The issue which is causing most attention and discussions is as to whether the EU needs to again change its treaties, but there's more which has to be decided. So I think there's plenty of reasons why coming together today, discussing about uh, the young generation and their involvement in EU politics, their consideration is, comes at the right time. Um, we, I'm looking very much forward to the debate, and we will start this debate uh, with Sven Tetzlaff, who is the head of... Um, the head of the Department of Education at the Kerber Foundation, um, the leading cooperation partner with respect to Future Lab, and he will introduce by putting things into a perspective, maybe also saying something a bit more about Future Lab, and then I will hand over to my co-moderator, Anna, who will also uh, explain a bit more about how we will conduct today's event. So Sven, the floor is yours, if you want to use the lectern.
Thank you, Yanis, very much. Dear Commissioner, dear young Europeans, and I'm very happy that so many of you are in this room today, uh, dear guests. Let me welcome you to our Europe at Debate event here in Brussels. It's the 12th Europe at Debate since Future Lab started in <coughs> 2011. And in the last three years, uh, Future Lab Europe has dealt with different European problems and topics but one question was important for all of them. In which way are the young Europeans affected? I think this question applies particularly for the discussion to today. What does it mean if a whole generation is missing in EU politics and how can the young Europeans be involved? We all already uh, heard the challenges, the underrepresentation of young people in EU politics is alarming. That can be observed on two different levels. First, on the direct level, youth does not take part in elections, like in the EP election in 2009, when only one third of the electorate under 35 went out to vote. Second, on the indirect level, there's a clear lack of representation of young Europeans in the political parties and in parliaments. In the European Parliament, in this year, less than 10% out of all the MEPs are under 39 years of age. Why is that a serious problem? For at least two reasons. And uh, Janis also mentioned it before. The lack of involvement of young people takes place in a time when stakes have never been higher youth unemployment rates are extremely high. There is a high pressure on government services such as education and welfare states are declining. The young generation is affected very much by that. And second, in the light of the current demographic development, the problem of underrepresentation will worsen. Why? Because Europe is very likely to be turned into an some say overall home for the elderly within the time frame of roughly one generation. In 2050, nearly 40% of the EU population will be 60 years old. If those who are young today are really expected to make their active contribution to the future of Europe, then we need to find ways to include their topics and concerns into the debate and into the decision-making process. Future Lab Europe wants to make a contribution to that, the initiative of 10 European foundations that is operated by the European Policy Center provides an opportunity for young Europeans to develop ideas and raise their voice on what they think uh, <coughs> should be the Europe of the future. Today we will talk about their ideas linked to EU politics. Members of Future Lab Europe come from 26 different countries, some of which, like Turkey, Serbia, Macedonia, Ukraine, and Russia, are not, not yet, members of the EU. But we are convinced that it is important to also involve young people from these countries into a European dialogue about democracy, participation, <coughs> and identity. It will be interesting to get to know their perspective on this issue today. So, I come to the end. We are happy to be back in Brussels again, and we are honored to have the opportunity to raise the question of political participation with you, Commissioner Endor, and with our four panelists, three panelists today. I hope there will be a lively discussion. Thank you all for joining us <coughs> for this Europe at Debate. I thank you very much for your interesting remarks. Hello, my name is Anna, and I represent one of the future labbers. I am from Estonia, from the time zone GMT plus two, meaning already one hour ahead of you guys. So, with that being said, um, I am here to speak a bit further about what Future Lab is about. As we've heard, we are young people from 26 countries, and we are here in Europe to learn from you guys, to let you guys learn from us, and to be led, to lead, and also to participate and promote political participation in Europe. So what we have been up to is, we have met in Brussels, this is the second time, 
and we have come together and discussed among ourselves, very sharply, I must say, and also heard a lot of decision makers, political leaders, experts talk about their visions of Europe. So that is what Future Lab is about, discussions, debating, learning and experience. But it is not only a program to gain knowledge or experience, it is also a program for us to contribute to the involvement of more youth throughout Europe, meaning we write articles for different European newspapers to talk about what the youth today care about. And of course, the only thing we can talk about is what we know and what we care about and hope that that's the same thing with other young people. But moreover, we also try to promote youth involvement in European politics and especially just voting in European elections, European Parliament elections, and making sure that youth that perhaps does not come to Brussels, but that goes to school every day and thinks, oh, this Europe, I don't know what it's about, uh, will think about at least going and giving a vote and taking that time to look up what European affairs are about and how they affect our everyday lives. And as you probably might know, European parliamentary elections, luckily or not so luckily, have already managed to stir up quite many things, at least in my home country, Estonia, and also, I heard yesterday, in neighbouring Finland. So congratulations, European Parliament elections are a bit exciting. For those of you who want to bring up excitement about this event, uh, we suggest that you tweet about it, as we've heard, or sometimes presume some young people like Twitter. And, and even some other people like Twitter as well. So the hashtag for this event is YouthGap, uh, which can be uh, translated in very many different ways. But I suggest that you use it and talk about um, your ideas, feelings and, and reflections that you get throughout these discussions and debates. So that was briefly what Future Lab is about. Now to move on to what this event very briefly is about. I understand almost all of you have the publication that uh, two of our young, very talented Europeans have put together. Yes. If you don't, then uh, you're going to feel a bit left out when they actually do talk about it. Uh, so firstly, we're going to hear a lovely presentation from a uh, few young European uh, ladies. And then later on, we're going to hear some remarks made by the European decision makers or policy makers, if you'd like. And this will be our commission representative, Mr. Ander. And later on, uh, well, not a debate, although I hope it will turn out to be a constructive debate, but uh, from the members of uh, European Parliament, or also from the prospective members of European Parliament. So good luck to them now and for future. And then you all will have a chance to ask questions from these guys, or also give your reflections on what they have thought. Uh, so for both the Commissioner and the, the discussions we will have with MEPs, you will have a chance to ask questions and I hope you will already start thinking about how you would solve the youth participation crisis. Um, and then later on we will have some summary remarks, we will end, maybe have a bit of a light lunch and then we'll all be sure that we have solved the problem of youth participation <laughs> by coming here. Uh, yes, I am as optimistic as it gets. Um, with that being said, uh, it is my honor, my great honor, to introduce uh, you with two lovely ladies, who are Dori and uh, <coughs> Sandra. She's actually my roommate, but somehow I forget her name uh, now that I'm in front of you. But she is uh, very, very lovely, and they are going to give you a presentation on what is their perspective and our perspective as the future lab of Europe, what is missing from European politics or from the lives of young people that they do not want to participate or don't find it important to participate in European elections and also their perspective on what could really be done to bring those people in. So, Dorit and Sandra, you have the floor. Thank you, Anna. Uh, dear Commissioner, members of the European Parliament and honourable guests, First, I have to say thank, to, thank you to both uh, Sven and Janis for pointing out the challenging youth are facing at the moment in Europe. This was also our inspiration for the publication we wrote, because if we are in a challenging situation, we need to change it, and also youth need to be involved in that process. Uh, looking at the current uh, composition of representatives in the European Parliament, one can see that on, out of 766 members of the European Parliament, only two are under the age of 30, and only 7.5% are below the age of 40. 
As Sven also already mentioned, young people didn't really actively participate in the elections in 2009. Only 29% of the young people under the age of 24 voted, and just about 36% of the voters aged 25 to 30 showed up at the polling station. These numbers are alarming, especially in the light of the upcoming European Parliament elections in May. Why is it that participation of young Europeans is so little, and how can it be improved? We find this is important because the European Parliament is the democratic flagship of the European Union, and its elections are a vital element in the legitimacy of the EU's democratic system. At the moment, we can see a generation missing in the European politics. When a certain group in society are structurally excluded from political participation or do not exercise their right as the European citizen, the legitimacy of the system is undermined. It is important to get the young people to the polling station. It is shown that in the three first election you are able to vote in, that also shape your future voter habits. To find answers to our questions and to give young Europeans a possibility to have a say, we from Future Lab Europe carried out an online, su online survey which was spread all over Europe. We received a thousand answers from all over Europe. On the basis of the results, we identified four root causes to the lack of pol political participation among young Europeans. First, the elections and the EU politics are not enough politicized. Young people do not see the importance of voting because they cannot see the, how their vote affects the European politics. There is a lack of a truly European debate and a political system that could uh, politicize both the elections and the EU. We can also see that there is too few young people represented in uh, elected office. This goes both on the national level and the EU level, but also within the political parties where we see an enormous lack of uh, young po people's participation. At the moment, only 2% <coughs> of the young people in Europe are a member of a, European part, uh, of a political party. Thirdly, we saw that there seems to be either a perceived or a real lack of focus or in our discussions on subjects that are of interest to young people. According to our survey, we should uh, discuss more education, employment, and also environmental protection, citizen participation, and mobility. One has to note that EU has already put in place programs addressing this issue. So this also leads us to the fourth cause we identify, that there is a lack of information and communication, and this affects uh, young Europeans' voting habits. Future Lab Europe respondents indicate that the lack of information and knowledge about EU is the most important cause of their reluctance to vote. Looking at those four main challenges, we came up with concrete recommendations to get more youth involved in European politics. Firstly, widen the political dimension towards Europe, which can mean organizing truly pan-European elections, conducting the political debate on actually uh, European issues, in particular those relevant for young Europeans, instead of focusing on national or local interests only. Secondly, strengthen the representation of young Europeans. In the decision-making process, the political parties should pay more attention to the subjects that are of greatest interest to young Europeans. Also, political parties should put in place programs to find educated and guide new generations of pot uh, potential politicians to increase the number of young people in office. Lastly, improve <coughs> information on election. Election campaigns on the national and the European level should clearly outline plans and issues interested in, uh, for youth. Clear information on the election should be made available, in particular on the candidates and the election program. Also, younger people throughout Europe should be educated more in the his historical development and the decision-making process of the European institution, and in particular, the, how the EU currently works. What's more, the mass media should not simply report decisions, but the diverse spectrum of the decision-making process. As the parliament cannot be seen as one block, people need to see the certain various groups with different positions. We believe 
the low young uh, participation is a challenge which needs to be faced and seriously considered. With those recommendations, we are looking forward to go into deeper discussions. Dear Commissioner, I would invite you to come over. Oh, really? <laughs> 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 Sorry, it took a minute. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, uh, Dorit. So uh, we heard both an analysis and we also heard of what needs to be done. So we need to politicize. We need to fo focus on issues which are closer to the heart of young Europeans and get them involved more in politics. And we need to inform young Europeans, but Europeans in general, about the EU So in order to provide more knowledge about what is happening at European level and also why it makes but it's necessary to participate in, in one way or the other in European politics. I now want to hand over to uh, Commissioner Laszlo Andor, who is a Commissioner for Employment, Social Affairs and Inclusion in the Barroso II Commission since 2010. And in this town, there is no real need to introduce him because he is very well known. Um, and he's, I think, uh, one of the voices, or maybe one of the most prominent voices when it comes to the issues related to the social dimension of Europe um, with respect to uh, the challenges which are out there, what need to be done, and quoting from a publication which he published uh, together with uh, or at the European Policy Center, he said that there's a need to define binding employment and social standards in the framework of economic and monetary union in order to, and I quote, prevent a social race to the bottom. This is just one quote of many which refer to the social dimension, and I'm sure that in his uh, speech he will refer to that and to the, the need to involve and how to involve the younger generation. Mr. Commissioner, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning. I would like to thank you, first of all, for this invitation and this opportunity to participate in this very important debate, um, and I congratulate EPC for another uh, initiative in which we can uh, cooperate. Indeed, uh, there have been many in the last uh, four years, and I'm grateful uh, to your strong attention to the social dimension and, um, in general, the social consequences of the current crisis and the policy uh, debates and initiatives uh, that have been put forward in order to counter them. Uh, but this is exactly my first point. The Commission is better known for doing policy rather than politics. Uh, nevertheless, at the time of elections, obviously, we have to strengthen our involvement in uh, uh, European um, uh, politics and to do more to connect the European political level with the national politics. E even uh, at the time of the European elections, uh, uh, the political de debate takes place on national languages, in the national fora, in the national uh, context, and um, uh, obviously, this very often uh, questions um, uh, the very existence of um, a European civil society or of a European uh, polity. So these are very, very relevant uh, uh, questions. However, uh, the fundamental point that has been made in this uh, uh, summary and the presentation uh, which we just heard is that the participation and the representation of uh, the young people in the European pol political process and in the European institutions is relatively low. And this is a problem. Uh, and I share uh, this view. I think uh, uh, there should be a stronger involvement, stronger participation, and stronger representation of uh, uh, the young people. <coughs> but before uh, going into uh, the policy aspects of this, um, let me just say that, in my view, it's not entirely surprising uh, that uh, uh, the, the young people's representation is weaker. Uh, I think it primarily, I think this is primarily uh, the consequence of uh, uh, socialization, political socialization in the national context. We grow up, first of all, with our national languages, um, with our national uh, history, 
at school we primarily learn about national heroes and very often about European anti-heroes. Um, and it takes obviously time to learn about the broader European context. It takes time uh, to understand what the current European debates are exactly about. Many of these issues are just very, very complex. Like the, 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 the crisis of the monetary union um, is not uh, very simple even for, even for more experienced uh, 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 politicians. And um, we have seen many more experienced politicians uh, failing in this, uh, in, this, uh, in this area. But apart from the political socialization in the national context, I think the other uh, important point at the start is that what motivated a lot of people uh, to participate in European politics uh, historically uh, is not so much appealing for the current young generation since the European integration grew out of uh, uh, the wars, the many conflicts uh, on the European continent, and the intention to overcome the extreme forms of nationalism, chauvinism, uh, and racism. And uh, at this time, when we probably take peace for granted, uh, this very motivation uh, is much weaker, even if the Nobel Prize Committee was very kind to remind everyone that uh, it's the European integration which has done so much uh, to secure peace on this continent. So there are many reasons behind a lower participation and representation, but I do agree with you that this is a problem. Because if uh, you don't participate, if you are not represented, decisions will be taken without you. And that probably also means that decisions will be taken almost certainly at your expense, uh, if you are not directly or indirectly uh, participated, participating. Uh, and uh, the impact of the crisis is just a very uh, uh, clear example uh, to illustrate uh, this problem, and especially in the area of the unemployment. Uh, you probably know that this six-year-long crisis pushed uh, unemployment uh, to an unprecedented high level in the European Union. If you look at the recent uh, about six months on average, in the European Union we have a uh, um, a, a, an 11% unemployment rate, in the Eurozone about 12%. It just started to uh, decline in both um, the Eurozone and the EU as such, but this is a very, very high uh, level, especially if you look behind these figures and see the enormous diversity uh, of the EU, the asymmetries between the core of the Eurozone and the periphery of the Eurozone, and on the periphery uh, these figures being sometimes more than twice as high as uh, the EU average, not uh, just uh, twice as high as uh, some of the better performing core countries like Austria or, 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 or Germany. And uh, what is even more dramatic in my view that in the whole of the six years, uh, whenever there was an increase of unemployment, the youth unemployment rate increased significantly faster than the overall unemployment rate. And in 2010 and early 11, when there was a halt with the rise of unemployment in the EU, the youth unemployment continued to increase, which altogether means that the young generation has been hit disproportionately, very unfairly and very disproportionately uh, by uh, uh, this crisis. And this obviously triggered a number of uh, initiatives uh, uh, from the European Commission and the institutions in general. Indeed, uh, the policies of the Commission were driven by politics. We have been in a constant dialogue with um, the agents who helped uh, uh, the, the, the shaping of uh, these policies, the European Parliament, the youth organizations, or the social partners, the employers and the employees organizations, which in the area of the employment policy are uh, uh, playing a crucial role. Uh, for example, in the European Parliament, uh, we worked a lot with uh, the youngest member of the parliament, uh, Emily Turunen from Denmark, who was actually one of the originator, originators of the idea of the youth guarantee and presenting it as a proposal uh, to the commission in 2010. 
Um, what concerns youth organizations, uh, obviously there is a, a European body uh, with whom we regularly consult together with Andrula Vassili, who has the primary responsibility for the youth in the Commission, but also in national fora. We often met uh, uh, the, 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 the representatives of the young people. Just with the Spanish Youth Council, I had two uh, uh, meetings, and I could give other examples as well. Some actually came to uh, Brussels, uh, like, for example, the Indignados, who were staging big uh, demonstrations in Spain in 2011, uh, also sent their delegation uh, to uh, Brussels. They were camping uh, just not far away uh, uh, from here, and there were several uh, exchanges with uh, the Commission officials, um, which indeed uh, helped developing some of the policies of uh, the time. I could also mention the Youth Parliament, <coughs> Um, which I met one year ago in Munich, uh, which is, um, uh, if you don't know, an organization which helps uh, young people to prepare for political roles um, and especially for parliamentary uh, roles. And there we also uh, discussed uh, uh, the state of play with uh, the Youth Guarantee and other uh, proposals of uh, uh, the Commission. The social partners uh, themselves created um, uh, their own um, uh, uh, agreement uh, about uh, uh, action against youth unemployment. And this was not only European, but also global, because in the G20, uh, there has been a task force to combat youth unemployment in this area, which also gives uh, evidence that this is not only a European problem, while it is true that some of the European countries, eminently Sp uh, Spain and Greece, uh, have been the one uh, that have been suffering the highest level of um, uh, unemployment uh, among uh, the young people. Just to mention uh, some of the key initiatives of the last four years um, uh, for the young people, uh, it started with the Youth on the Move uh, as part of uh, the Europe 2020 strategy, one of the flagship initiatives focusing on mobility, two aspects of mobility, uh, student mobility and labor mobility for uh, the young people in order to ensure that there are more rights and more opportunities for the young generation than before and uh, the young people are also informed and they have a better access to these opportunities than in the past. One of the crucial budgetary proposals came out of this flagship initiative. Uh, the fact that eventually the budget of the Erasmus program was increased by 40% at a time when actually the European budget first time was cut in nominal terms. I think this is a very, very important step, even if you compare it to the original Commission proposal, which was about plus 70%. Uh, the 40% is still uh, a, a, a very important increase. And um, I think student mobility is uh, something which uh, which uh, is, is the best uh, among uh, uh, the benefits of the EU and especially what it can provide for the use. However, as, uh, instead of a sustainable recovery, the EU and especially the Eurozone was, ga was going back to um, another recession in 2011. Um, we adopted um, uh, what we call the Youth Opportunities Initiative at the end of um, 2011. Um, uh, in, in order to ensure that the financial resources of the EU, especially the structural funds, benefit uh, young people, young job seekers faster and more efficiently, especially in the eight countries of that time uh, which had the highest youth unemployment rates. And that was the four southern countries, Portugal, Spain, Italy and Greece, plus two Baltics, Latvia and Lithuania, and Ireland which also was a program country at uh, that time. And we also relaunched um, the, uh, the discussion about the Youth Guarantee, which uh, did not really take off in 2010, when there was some complacency about um, uh, a more rapid uh, uh, recovery in the European economy. So this was relaunched and um, formulated in a concrete proposal in the Youth Employment Package in December 2012, and then the Council uh, turned out to be much faster than before and adopted um, uh, this proposal uh, with uh, 
with a very impressive uh, speed. I'm not going into uh, details um, of the use guarantee. I would um, assume that uh, uh, this is a well-known uh, policy. Um, if it's not, then tomorrow we will have a full-day conference here in Brussels, um, opening uh, with uh, President Barroso himself, um, and we will discuss in a variety of uh, panels and workshops the implementation, the ongoing implementation of uh, the uh, use guarantee uh, in this uh, conference uh, tomorrow. But this was not the only initiative. We also put forward a quality framework for traineeships in order to ensure that the very poor quality, exploitative forms of employment uh, for young people, which became very widespread in uh, uh, the crisis years, but also before the crisis, uh, would be phased out and the practice would develop towards uh, decent employment standards. For example, traineeships with learning content or written contracts uh, between uh, the employers and the young people. This has been adopted in March by the Council. And um, uh, I have mentioned, but let's um, uh, also raise uh, here the issue of uh, labour mobility for the young people. This has also been, of course, uh, uh, part of the youth employment package and promoted as part of the solution, not the only solution, but as part of the solution to the high youth unemployment uh, uh, levels, especially in the South. Um, of course, without assuming that the labor mobility in itself would resolve the big uh, imbalances of uh, the Eurozone. But from the opinion surveys, what we know is that um, uh, a large part uh, of the young generation, at least half of the young people, are ready, are interested to work uh, in another country if there are better opportunities and uh, the EU can provide concrete help uh, by pilot programs through improving the US, uh, uh, the, uh, the European Employment Service in order to see uh, uh, the available vacancies better and create a better match between uh, the job seekers and uh, the companies that um, that um, uh, offer uh, jobs also in these times. Uh, so many young people uh, became, in a way, economically mobilized. Well, this, of course, brings a risk uh, to politics uh, if they become politically demobilized uh, as a result of um, uh, working in a different environment um, in a country which is distant uh, from uh, the home. So this is obviously an additional uh, hurdle uh, which needs to be looked at um, whether uh, studying or working um, in another country than the country of the origin um, appears as a barrier uh, for political participation. Now, uh, finally, let me just uh, highlight that, of course, the young people would need to participate in the discussions and the decisions strongly when it's exactly about them, when, uh, when uh, uh, it's about the learning opportunities, when it's about the working opportunities of the young people. But this cannot be really disconnected from the broader political debates. Uh, this cannot be disconnected from the EU budget. This cannot be disconnected from uh, various proposals about sorting out the monetary crisis, the Eurozone crisis. Uh, this cannot be uh, disconnected from uh, the uh, deepening of the single market or even the international, the external relations of uh, the uh, European Union. So, of course, uh, there has to be some encouragement for young people and further information provided in order to uh, learn more about the policies that directly affect them and participate in the discussions uh, on, on those areas like education or uh, school to work transition, um, but uh, but um, uh, since uh, you know through major decisions, uh, when it's about the EMU, when it's about the single market, uh, the future is decided for the long term, uh, for decades ahead, um, and it's going to be your life uh, uh, and not only the life of those who are taking the decisions and uh, will soon probably leave their offices. Um, this uh, calls for a much stronger uh, uh, involvement in the political debates. Sometimes these political debates look like uh, too simplified, 
do we want more Europe or do we want less Europe? Sometimes these simplifications, of course, form part of uh, the discussion. But one thing is sure, the young generation needs, and in my view also deserves, a better Europe, and that's what we should work uh, for together. Thank you very much for your attention. I thank you for your remarks, and you will now have the opportunity to ask questions or perhaps reflect on few things that the Commissioner has talked about. Uh, and while I give the, the back rows a bit of few minutes to, to think it over, what is the best question you have on your list of thousands of questions? Um, but I will firstly get to uh, some of the future labbers who I'm sure are well, I, I wouldn't want to say dying to, to ask questions, but at least uh, probably rather excited to ask those questions. Yes, uh, uh, Ninja, or Ninja, uh, however you want to call it. Yeah, Ninja. <laughs> I'm from Germany and I would like to know. Okay. Um, knowing what you're knowing now, what would you do differently in your term if you could restart now? <laughs> I will going to give this microphone for this excellent, excellent answer. <laughs> it's, an, it's an excellent question, of course, but it would require longer reflection about uh, the four-year period. Uh, maybe uh, what I think anyone can see if you look at the four-year period, that um, instead of um, a, a sustainable recovery, which was envisaged in 2010, um, the, the European economy uh, went into a recession in 2011, second half. Um, of course, this was not forecasted. So some, somewhere there was um, a forecasting failure. Uh, it's not the DG employment which does uh, such forecasting in the commissions, I have to tell you. Uh, but obviously, the policies and the decisions in the commission and in the council, uh, I believe, could have reflected better the actual situation if the forecast uh, would have been better. Thank you, but of course we can imagine that when you're inside that room making those decisions, it, it, it might be impossible to, to have better forecasts. But another question from uh, Miruna. Dear um, Commissioner, I am Miruna from uh, Romania. And you tackle the most uh, important problem of young people in Europe, which is youth employment. And also you referred uh, to mobility of young people, which is, of course, a priority. And some presented it as a solution for uh, youth unemployment, saying that people who do not find jobs, they could uh, go try to, to study in other country or start a business or find a job. But at the same time, in the last year, we have witnessed a very strong anti-immigration debate in some founding member states of the EU especially Germany uh, or UK, um, France and uh, after that uh, UK, especially directed against Romanians and Bulgarians. I would say that this type of young people are in a more, more vulnerable position because they have not only to face their problem of not finding a job, but also a very strong uh, stigmatizing uh, anti-immigration discourse as they are seen as migrants and not as EU citizens using the rights to travel or to find a job. How does the European Commission, how did the European Commission try to, to fight against this uh, discriminatory behavior of member states? Again, uh, I could spend uh, an, an hour uh, or a day uh, to answer this question because indeed uh, in the last six months this has been a major debate. In fact, uh, the most uh, difficult uh, debates are uh, in, in some countries which were not the founders of um, the European Economic Community, but um, uh, UK on general, uh, and also more recently Denmark is a country where uh, the discussions are, are, are really uh, annoying. Um, <laughs> it is annoying because uh, very often uh, the discussion is about non-issues, non-existing issues, like benefit tourism. Uh, there's a widespread uh, uh, discussion about uh, the so-called benefit tourism, which is largely a myth, especially as compared to uh, the rhetoric of uh, some politicians and some of the tabloid uh, media uh, in the UK and other countries. Uh, this is absolutely disproportionate and appalling, um, exactly because uh, these uh, 
uh, circle started to kind of use a language vis-a-vis uh, -vis other European nations um, as if uh, anyone who is a Romanian or Bulgarian national would immediately be a suspect uh, when uh, uh, arriving to Dover or Luton um, and, uh, and, and coming just to take advantage of uh, the welfare system of the receiving uh, uh, country. Uh, while it has been widely proven, uh, and this has been one of the answers of the Commission, uh, to present uh, the evidence, to present uh, the, the facts, the calculations, um, uh, which prove uh, that uh, the migrant workforce uh, contributes a lot to the GDP of the receiving countries. Furthermore, the migrant workforce actually is a net contributor to the welfare budget of uh, uh, these countries. Uh, so it's, it's, it's really atrocious uh, sometimes when uh, uh, politicians uh, and journalists ignore this and just try to play to the gut feelings and, um, and, and play uh, to, and, and to exploit this subject in order to uh, kind of generate uh, political support for them. In the UK, the discussion is also difficult because uh, one political uh, force, the UKIP, also uses this subject in order to generate a, a, a broader anti-EU feeling uh, when the country may face a, gen a, a referendum uh, on this uh, question. So it's up to uh, not only the Commission, but also all the responsible political forces in these countries uh, to clarify for the general public what exactly is the situation. And we can help them in this because uh, there are, uh, there's a good analytical base, not just anecdotal evidence. You can find anecdotal evidence about practically everything. You can find anecdotal evidence about uh, you know, benefit sheets or, 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 or whatever other type of anomaly. Uh, but when you want to evaluate the free movement of workers, you have to p see the bigger picture, um, uh, the, the, the millions of people who participate in this and benefit uh, from it. So the Commission in November adopted a communication um, about the free movement, um, and uh, including five actions in order to ensure that if there are uh, tensions uh, either on the sending or the receiving side, uh, these tensions should be easily uh, uh, solved. And um, we hosted um, in February a conference for mayors of major European cities, which um, are receivers of uh, uh, mobile workers from other EU countries, uh, who might be uh, sometimes uh, uh, difficult to employ, uh, this also, I think, has to be recognized that sometimes it happens that people come without the proper language skills, without proper skills at all, with children who need school, with additional teachers. So there, there can be costs if a local uh, uh, government faces a situation of um, uh, people uh, arriving uh, without the skills and um, uh, without the work experience. Uh, but this uh, can be resolved. There are financial resources within these countries, but also the European Social Fund, in order to ensure that uh, there is additional investment, active labor market policies, social services, uh, which are needed in such uh, situations. But even if you take into account this cost, uh, the receiving countries uh, should see better the advantages. And this is, of course, uh, uh, a cultural question. So it's not only a question of math to demonstrate uh, who gains what in terms of GDP or, um, or, or euros going into the welfare budget or coming out of the welfare uh, budget. This is also about recognizing that when the EU enlargement took place, it's not only countries, it's not only markets that came to the European Union, but people with equal rights, people with equal social rights, and that uh, needs to be uh, better understood. Would you have any bold suggestions for, for the next commission that they could perhaps do, you know, some crazy ideas that you have thought uh, after the end of your session? Or all the proposals you pointed out, all the things you would like to succeed have happened during your time well, in the commission? Uh, there, is a, there is always a, a list of uh, uh, issues um, where we have been working, but uh, maybe the momentum did not come uh, for making a proposal. Or, um, or, um, or, or we have been doing something 
uh, which could be more robust if there is a justification or a call. I mentioned the quality framework on traineeships. The quality framework is not a legislative uh, proposal, right? It's what we call soft law in the European Union. In an area where there was no EU activity before, um, of course, there is a way to uh, work with the member states, work with uh, stakeholders um, in order to improve practices which are often controversial uh, in many countries, not only in Europe, but also America and elsewhere. Uh, if this is seen insufficient, obviously, in the next commission, uh, it's possible to consider uh, a stronger uh, legislative instrument in uh, uh, this area, but then there has to be a call. Uh, for it. The stakeholders uh, in, in this particular case, especially the young people, should say that, okay, this is nice, but not sufficient, and uh, we would like to see uh, more. But at first, I think it's, um, it's important that there is a, already an explanation of uh, what the problem is and what are the better practices, and this is exactly uh, the mandate of uh, the quality framework. There are other areas um, uh, which was quoted from our previous uh, cooperation with the APC, um, especially what concerns the social dimension of the monetary union, because um, on that front um, we have made some concrete proposals that uh, do not require additional legislation, like for example strengthening the social dialogue on the EU level in order to involve the social partners more in the discussion of uh, the Eurozone imbalances and their employment and social consequences. However, we also highlighted the possibility to, uh, to establish uh, um, so-called automatic social stabilizers in the architecture of the monetary union, uh, for example, in the form of uh, uh, pooling or partial pooling of unemployment insurance on the EU level. Last Friday, uh, another think tank uh, uh, in Brussels was holding a big conference, in fact, a two-day conference, Thursday and Friday, and uh, there was a specific workshop um, uh, discussing this um, idea on which various other think tanks like the Bertelsmann Foundation have been working in the meantime. And it seems uh, that this, uh, since October, when the Commission made um, uh, this communication, since October there has been some kind of snowballing effect uh, because more and more people start to understand the relevance of um, uh, such uh, proposals. Um, and um, and uh, perhaps after the second half of this year, this can also reach uh, a different stage. Mm -hmm. So if there are any prospective uh, future commissioners here, then uh, you can of course take an example or start tweeting. Uh, and now we also uh, had a question from one of the uh, later members, latter members of the panel, uh, Miss Sandra. Yes, thank you so much. Um, being one of the youngest uh, members of the European Parliament, I would like to address to uh, Commissioner today. And uh, in this way, we could uh, possibly demonstrate why is it important to be involved in uh, politics. Um, I have a specific uh, question and a specific problem. Um, namely, we had uh, Croatia is one of the youngest uh, member countries, we, uh, I come from Croatia, and we have been members for uh, eight months now, I think. And uh, we have been uh, fighting with youth uh, unemployment, you know that uh, the rates of unemployment are sky high in Croatia, 49.8%. Uh, our youth unemployment rates have never been uh, low, but uh, after the economic crisis, uh, after the start in 2008, uh, they became really sky high. And uh, we have been financing uh, the measures for fighting youth unemployment from the national uh, budget. But uh, since we are in the excessive debt uh, procedure at the moment, we have been experiencing some severe budget cuts and we cannot finance uh, the measures from the national budget. Uh, I would like to ask you uh, whether you can help uh, in being a partner to our Ministry of Labor and Pension System uh, with the uh, implementing program because we haven't, haven't been experienced uh, as, a, as being a newest member state in uh, implementing programs. So I hope uh, your response is going to be positive and we can, <laughs> <laughs> all, yes, of course, uh, demonstrate why is it important to be here today. <laughs> Thank you. Exactly. It is so positive that I have already raised uh, this issue with a high official 
um, uh, two weeks ago because this uh, budgeted decision uh, was taken uh, not so long ago. Uh, but the point is that um, it's not excessive debt, but excessive deficit procedure. And even if uh, uh, the deficit has been a problem, um, uh, this modest spending on youth employment should not be really uh, an issue, uh, bec especially because um, it also anticipates um, the uh, financial support from the youth employment initiative. So the country could spend which later will be refunded uh, from uh, the EU uh, financial resources as soon as the operational program is in place, and that should be just a matter of weeks. So uh, if there is an issue, obviously we can uh, discuss with Minister Mircic at the end of uh, this month when we probably meet in Athens. But maybe on, on broader terms um, on, on, on Croatia, I uh, kind of skipped, um, uh, but... Uh, but um, I was about mentioning an important um, uh, program we had in 2012, the European Year on Active Aging and Solidarity Between Generations, uh, which uh, uh, unfortunately allowed uh, uh, too much attention to shift to the old generation itself, uh, how to ensure that all the workers can remain longer in the labor market and when they retire remain autonomous in their life. However, the solidarity between the generations uh, is also an issue that needs to be uh, 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 promoted um, and there's no better context than Croatia to mention it because in Croatia pensioners are very well organized, um, veterans are very well organized, uh, the country still you know, feels some of the legacy of uh, the conflicts of the 1990s in terms of economic uh, legacy of uh, those uh, conflicts. Croatia is not alone because Serbia is, has even higher youth unemployment um, uh, rate which shows that fundamentally the way the labor market is organized um, is, is not really uh, suitable for the young people. So there's a need for you know, working on more, uh, more than just spending the little sums that can come uh, from the EU support. Thank you, and maybe a few questions from the back. Has anyone gotten a good one? Well, not really the back, but all right. Yes, go ahead, sir. Yeah, thanks, uh, Commissioner Ander, Marcel Kreikenbohm, working for the representation of Bremen. Uh, I've got. Just speak to the microphone. Yes, the wonders of modern technology sometimes. Oh, well, we'll just switch then. <laughs> Take this. Okay, that looks better. So, uh, thanks, Commissioner Ander, for your remarks. I've got two points. Uh, first, um, uh, thanks for um, referring to this uh, social tourism uh, poverty migration point. I'd just like shortly to add that I believe this uh, discussion, which is taking part in Germany, I believe is annoying as well. So, <laughs> this is just uh, to add. Uh, my second point. Um, I'd like to pick one uh, remark from this uh, report, and that's uh, about the participation. How can you uh, uh, hire the participation in decision making? So I haven't heard a lot about um, this policy uh, framework for youth, uh, youth policy about the structural dialogue. So I know German lender are quite involved into this. So just a question, how can you set up a structured um, forms of dialogue to get young people involved. So uh, just to hear a little what to do on European level to find structure to get them more into policy making. I don't know, maybe um, youth parliaments or stuff like this. There can be lots of ideas, so maybe we can talk about this yes. a little. Fill the schools with uh, commissioners with questions for young people. So what is your perspective? How could the dialogue be improved? Well. Um in, in reality, this should be a question to Andrula Vasiliu, who is indeed responsible for the structural dialogue. I explained um, how in my area uh, we connected with uh, uh, the young people in the various uh, organizations uh, or through the various organizations. Uh, uh, and we can be very innovative um, um, even within the existing legal framework. Because very often in order to, uh, to do more would require uh, some kind of change of the treaty or including more uh, uh, concrete um, agents or fora 
in the treaty. Also in my area, uh, the, the, the two sides, employment and uh, the social affairs, the treaty base is not uh, symmetrical because we have a lot more concrete elements to, uh, and obligations to involve the social partners in the area of the employment policy rather than uh, 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 social affairs. But uh, you can always do more uh, uh, on a voluntary basis than what is required by the treaty itself. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Um, thank you for your speech. Thank you for being with us to answer questions, to reflect on comments which were made. I know that you have the chance to be here a bit longer, so uh, maybe at some point uh, you might come in again. When we uh, conceptualized this event, when we thought of what we would want to do today, uh, one thing which obviously came to our mind in early April, just some weeks ahead of the European Parliament elections, is that we want to give um, the voice, we want to give the opportunity to uh, young European politicians to come to us, to come and have a discussion with us. And I'm very happy that we have three. One is already an MEP, another one who wants to become an MEP, and the leader of a youth uh, party um, with us today. Uh, in your program, you will see that we had uh, four uh, young politicians, but unfortunately, Mrs. Kake this morning informed us that she is not able to come, so we're sorry about that. But I'm very happy that we have the three of you here, and I would ask you to kindly come to the panel to join us. Thank you. So we have with us... Uh, Three, um, Sandra Petrovic Jakovina, who has already introduced herself. Um, she is a member of the European Parliament from Croatia, um, so a young member of the Parliament, as Croatia is a young member state, the youngest. Um, and um, she is a um, member of um, the um, Social Democratic Party of Croatia, so she's part of S&D, and we're very happy to have her with us. Um, she's dealing with constitutional affairs, I found out. She's in the AFCO committee in the European Parliament. Um, um, we have with us also um, Benedikt Javor, who is uh, from Hungary. So he has an exciting um, evening after the elections yesterday behind him, and he just arrived this morning. Um, he is um, a member of a Hungarian Green Party, um, and he's... Uh, He's on the list to become a member of the European Party, so he's uh, actively campaigning. Um, and last but not least, my uh, compatriot, Kostadinos uh, Kiranakis, uh, who is the president of the youth organization of the European People's Party, um, who, uh, I'm not sure, are you um, trying to become a member of the European Party? Are you on the list, or not this time around? Okay, so uh, we're still awaiting to hear um, how that will work out, but we're very happy to have the three of you here um, because we thought that it is appropriate to talk to uh, people from the younger generation, which excludes me because I'm above 40, um, for what the reasons are for the fact that the younger generation does not get themselves that much involved when it comes to European politics. What could be done about that? Um, what your ideas are with respect to concrete initiatives. I hope that we will also be able to uh, have a, the ability to have a stronger distinct, distinction among the three of you in the sense of what are your priorities, which distinguishes you from the other, because obviously this is also a political race. Um, and um, what the, you could and should do um, with respect to issues which are close to the heart of the young in the next uh, upcoming political cycle. What we have agreed is that um, all three speakers will get the floor, will uh, share their views uh, with us uh, in, uh, let's say, around four to five minutes, um, so that we will have enough time afterwards for debate with all of you. And I would want to start with the lady, um, so I would ask uh, Sandra to uh, take the floor, please. Yes. Thank you so much for inviting me. 
It's working. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me today. I'm very grateful to be here with you. And uh, let me uh, present myself uh, in, a, in a short way. I'm born in 1985, which makes me 29. And uh, I have been a member of parliament from since uh, um, 1st July last year, uh, because Croatia joined the EU then. Uh, in January 2012, I became a member of uh, Croatian Parliament, uh, also one of the youngest uh, members. I was 26 years then. And uh, being such a young uh, politician, um, I think it makes me qualify, uh, qualified to speak here today uh, all, uh, about the positive, uh, positive uh, effe effects of, of, of uh, uh, young people being involved in politics, but also the negative and not so optimistic aspects. Um, I work every day and I use uh, every chance that I can get to uh, improve uh, the, lives, uh, the lives of uh, young people in my community. Uh, sometimes uh, it is very difficult because uh, young people in politics uh, are cons considered to be um, not, uh, not so much experienced and uh, not so much appreciated in the society. Uh, especially it's hard uh, being a young woman in politics. Uh, my party leadership uh, has uh, recognized the need of uh, young people getting involved in, in politics and, um, and I've uh, ran for the European Parliament on the fifth position last year and I was elected as the fifth member of, of my party. Uh, this year, the situation is slightly different. Uh, I have the eighth position now, and now it's not so uh, uh, so uh, uh, so mm, sure for me to be in the parliament again. Uh, this uh, this shows uh, how how difficult it is for for young people to. Uh, be to stay in politics maybe to become a young politician it's not so uh, it's not so uh, difficult but to stay in politics it's very it's very difficult you can be a, a shining star that will uh, shine for just one year and then you will just shut off uh, I am not so uh, optimistic on on uh, young people being involved in politics especially in these uh, times of economic and global uh, uh, crisis especially in the EU when you when you have to uh, make a really uh, big and uh, I mean you, you have to in the sec in the next term uh, politicians on the EU level will have to uh, face uh, some difficult decisions and young people are not uh, not uh, recognized as the people who can make these de decisions nowadays uh, but uh, as for the participation of young people in the elections uh, I'm very concerned um, because there were some surveys, uh, especially in Croatia, that show that uh, uh, young people are not uh, are not eager to vote to go out and vote, because they simply uh, think that their their opinion uh, their opinion doesn't matter. Um, According to the most uh, service, I think that uh, it is said that the political marketing is uh, indicated as the most important uh, uh, cause for youth turn uh, turnout. 70% uh, of young people have indicated uh, the political mar marketing as a reason. They, uh, they uh, think that uh, it, it leaves a lot of space for manipulation and it often results, uh, results in a disappoint, disappointment uh, with the political candidates uh, <laughs> that are elected in, in the end. Uh, 
lack of uh, relevant information is is one side of story. The second side of story is um, is youth organizing. I think that the youth organizing um, um, could could uh, encourage uh, youth motivation to act. And that's why many young people don't feel a uh, responsibility to improve their uh, state status in the community, uh, in, the, in their states, uh, mainly because they feel, uh, as, as I just said, that their opinion, opinion simply doesn't, do, doesn't matter. Um, there are some uh, some states, uh, not uh, for the moment, not the, s the members of the EU, that I could uh, perhaps uh, um, perhaps uh, mention as uh, as an example of uh, a young uh, as a possibility for young people to be involved in the executive positions in in the government. Uh, they, uh, th this example is uh, Serbia at the moment. Uh, they have in their government uh, young po uh, politicians such as Minister of Finance, Minister of Justice and Minister of uh, Education and Sports. Three young ministers around 30 years old. Th this means that uh, either they are really, really brave uh, or they they simply uh, do not uh, uh, see these uh, mm, these uh, uh, parts of these ministries as important ones. The second is uh, impossible. So it leaves it leaves the the first thesis as as a valid one. I would uh, I would say uh, mm. I would rather. Um, uh, finish here and uh, maybe uh, leave the micro to the other panelists uh, and what I want to, wanted to say is uh, I, w I would like the participants to ask uh, questions and uh, to uh, feel free to ask uh, us uh, whatever they want to. I just believe that the discussion is the way that we can uh, make this panel work, th uh, work rather than um, a pure ex cathedra uh, yes. lecture. Yeah, thank you. That is what we will do. Um, thank you, Sandra, um, for your personal account, which uh, I must say didn't always sound um, yeah. very optimistic. Um, and while I was listening to you, I was wondering, um, um, Benedict, um, what are the reasons why you think that you should and want to join the European Parliament? and? Um, why you think that that would make a difference, um, what your aspirations are if, when, you will have made it to the European Parliament. Um, good morning, everyone, and thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm very glad to be here with you and, and having this, this uh, very important discussion. And uh, this is the explanation why I would like to run for uh, the position of uh, the, uh, being the member of the European Parliament, because I see that there are uh, very deep and important problems all over Europe and inside the European institution as well. Europe is looking for itself how to uh, managing those problems which uh, Europe is facing uh, right now in the, the last uh, couple of years since the crisis. And uh, we still didn't find uh, the good answers for uh, a lot of our problems and I would like to be a partner uh, in finding the, the right answers. Um, what I would like to uh, tell you in my four minutes, which is only two now, um, I, I would like to, to dig in deeply into specific issues of uh, youth unemployment and um, uh, things like that, just raising three points which is, I think, very important uh, to find the answer for the question uh, of um, why there is a missing generation in EU politics. The first, and almost everyone was mentioned, is that this is not a missing generation in EU politics, it's a missing generation in politics, uh, even on, on the national level, on the local level. 
Um, and I think this is a very important problem. Uh, uh, young people are not participating uh, in politics uh, either on, on uh, the national level because they are missing the feeling of having a real effect or influence on decision making. What my one vote counts? How can I influence decision makers? And uh, this is not just the, the question of institutions or, or uh, legal uh, environment, but I think this is deeply a question of trust. And if we have a look on, on uh, public polls uh, or surveys, they show that uh, um, the lowest trust uh, to uh, the democratic institutions all over Europe is experienced among the young generations, under 30 generations. Uh, the general trust uh, to the democratic institutions in some member states is a half of the average uh, level, and this is, I think, uh, tragic. Um, young people believe or they feel that politics is not, about a pol uh, is not about the real problems. It's not talking about what um, is paining uh, for them. It's not about their issues. It's not uh, on their language. So it's, it's some bureaucratic political language which they don't understand, which they don't care, which uh, is, n is not about them. So um, uh, the gap, the use gap, uh, or the gap between the use and the politics is in use, is in, uh, is in uh, trust, is in language, as, and it is uh, about the issues politics is dealing with. Um, and also, I think that some young people who want to be active in politics is also that uh, they don't see the effectivity of, of politics. A lot of times they see great promises, like, I don't know, the international negotiations on, on climate change, and then they experience very small steps. And uh, in this case they say that why to participate in politics? Because politics is about talking and talking and talking without real results. Young people want solutions and answers and uh, reaction, uh, fast reactions. Uh, besides of that, uh, let me to uh, give one uh, additional remark. Is uh, a lot of people was talking about youth policy. Let me to be a little bit skeptic about youth policy. I think youth policy is good to face with specific problems of young people, but it's not able to face with the general problem of missing young generations in politics. Um, youth policy might be like uh, a game reserve for endangered species, uh, where we try to push all the problems of, of young generations, that this is youth policy. But I think young people won't be active in politics if they have the feeling that they, they are some kind of specific uh, existence uh, with a specific policy uh, measures. They want to participate in policy in general, not in use policy, in poli uh, politics in, in general. The second point I would like to raise, and perhaps uh, this is uh, because of the shocking result of uh, the Hungarian elections yesterday evening where the extreme right reached 21% 20 per, uh, that uh, there is not only a missing generation in politics or in European politics but there is a missing generation in democratic politics. Uh, at least in Central European countries but also in some uh, Western uh, member states the nature of extreme right uh, has been shifted. Um, it's not the old type of uh, Le Pen uh, extremists, uh, 70 years old, uh, talking to the old guys in the countryside. Extreme right all over Europe and extremely in Central and Eastern Europe became uh, a mobilizing and attractive political program for a lot of young uh, people. And I think this this is annoying, that democratic politics is not able to, to mobilize young people to participate in politics, and the extremist parties uh, are able to do that, and I think we have to learn this lesson because we cannot let uh, youngs to, uh, to move to, to the extreme, uh, extreme right. And of course, the crisis 
use unemployment, frustration, everything helps the extreme right uh, to, to reach the young people, but we cannot just sit and wait what's going to happen. And the third and last uh, point or issue to raise is why uh, young people are not so active in, uh, in European politics is not specifically um, the problem of the young uh, generation. I think it's the problem of the EU project. Originally, the EU project was a vision about the continent, how to imagine the future uh, of this continent. Right now, most, most of the people, including the young generations, regard the EU um, bureaucratic institution with distant decision-making, ununderstandable uh, debates and, and, and dilemma, um, and they don't feel that, uh, uh, that the European project is about their future. So what we have to, uh, to change, and it's not policy making, it's politics making, how to raise uh, a new vision about Europe, how to convince people that uh, Europe is about their future. Europe is not only uh, the European Commission and the European Parliament and, and bureaucratic institutions and, and, um, and regulation and, and so on, but uh, the EU is a big vision how to organize this continent to, uh, to live in, in uh, peace and harmony. And last, very last, if you uh, let me to uh, have uh, one additional uh, minute, is about what Greens uh, would like to or can do in, in this situation. First of all, I, I would say that uh, Greens are not just talking but acting. Um, uh, the co-leader of uh, the Green List, uh, of, uh, or uh, uh, the candidate for uh, the President of the European Commission, is Ka Keller, a German Green, young Green politician of 22 years old. So uh, she is one of the leaders of, of uh, the complete Green family uh, in European politics with, uh, with his uh, young age. The second, that, um, which is very important how to bring decision-making closer to, to people, is uh, the emphasis on participation and participation and participation. Green politics is always about participation, active citizenship, uh, inclusive uh, politics making. Um, also, I think uh, the green conviction on continuing the European integration uh, process is um, um, helping to find a new European vision which is attractive and, and mobilizing. Um, and the last point that green politics is future-oriented. Green politics is more about our future than any other politics. Uh, it's about how to live on the long run, and uh, young people are interested not only the next four years, the next parliamentary cycle, but about the whole future of um, 40, 50, 60 years, and green politics is about uh, that. So I hope that green politics is able to mobilize and uh, include uh, young generations in politics on the national and on the European level as well. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so again, um, thank you, Benedict, um, for sharing not only your analysis of where you think we stand, but also coming up with one with some concrete proposals of what need to be done in order to increase trust, in order to uh, reinvent Europe, providing a new vision. But also thank you for spicing up the debate a bit by saying why people should vote for the Greens if they think that, uh, that this is the better way of doing it, um, which leads me immediately to uh, Costadinos. Um, who is uh, the president of the youth EPP, so he is uh, currently probably also campaigning for um, Mr. Juncker, uh, who is not exactly 22 years old, um, but, uh, but sometimes being older does not mean that you think in terms of being older, but just even sometimes you also have um, a great mind to think in terms of uh, young thinking. So, Costadine, the floor is yours. Thank you, Yanni. And thank you to the Future Lab and the EPC for the kind invitation. 
Um, I have to say I'm a, a bit surprised um, before coming here. I thought, you know, a panel with S&D and, and the Greens probably lead to a intense debate, but I have to say I agree with you <laughs> uh, on most of your points uh, regarding engagement of young people in politics, um, except, of course, the ones regarding, you know, Greens winning the elections <laughs> and so on. Um, so instead of doing an analysis here, I'll try to tell you a story and, and build up an argument up around uh, why young people are so disappointed and so uh, distanced from Brussels and from uh, national politics, uh, as our friend from Hungary already said. So uh, the youth of the EPP is today the largest uh, youth organization, uh, political youth organization in Europe, uh, with more than a million members. Uh, represented by around 150 national uh, young members of national parliaments and more than 5,000 people who are elected in uh, local parliaments and, and regional ones. Uh, and with this uh, kind of uh, gigantic network, we are trying to uh, establish ourselves as a policy maker and not just um, a place for, for thinking and dialogue. So uh, the story is about a campaign that we started last June uh, on uh, job creation. Uh, we drafted together a plan uh, to create jobs for young Europeans and for Europeans in general. And once we did that and we agreed on that as an alliance, we, we, we tried to lobby for that in the EU institutions. Um, so we started with uh, commissioners, uh, we met with the President of the European Commission. Uh, we met with uh, a very high number of uh, members of European Parliament, uh, mostly from the EPP. Um, we met with <laughs> Prime Ministers. Uh, we met uh, with National Ministers of Employment. We met with bureaucrats. We met with a lot of people who, uh, in, in most of the cases, told us that someone else is responsible uh, for what we were asking for. Um, with a lot of effort and with a lot of hard work and, and targeted actions, we managed to pass some of the solutions we proposed in, um, in uh, a resolution adopted by the European Parliament and the priorities of our plan in the conclusions of the EU Council uh, in June. And we are very happy about it. And, you know, we believed back in the days that we achieved something important. And then we realized that, you know, from that point um, till the point that young people actually get a job uh, because of a good policy, um, you know, is like the distance between the moon and, and earth, um, or perhaps earth and the sun. <laughs> so uh, my point is that, you know, if the largest political youth organization tries to change something and tries to implement a policy uh, that we believe is good and many politicians and many decision makers believed also that is good and it, it is almost impossible in a tangible way and in a simple and understandable way to make it happen then what is the case for the smaller youth organizations that try to change something? What is the case for NGOs or citizen movements or even groups of young people or even national politicians who want to change something in EU politics? Today, with a system that Brussels works and the EU decides, it is simply impossible. And uh, Commissioner, you said that very correctly that uh, you know, if we are not engaged as young people, uh, decisions will be made without us. But what you need to know is that for most of the youth organizations, uh, the maximum mandate of young people who are engaged is two years. And the average time for, a new decisions to be, for a new decision to be made and then implemented is much more than two years. So for us, for all of us who decide to dedicate our lives, our time, our energy, our own money from our own budget, um, to do youth politics, to try to change something, because change is a key word that motivates us when we decide, instead of 
going to the beach in the summer to go to summer schools and train young people or work on policies. Um, it's not possible. And we have to make it possible. So the ground solution and the long-term solution that I see uh, in terms of engaging young people into national politics and EU politics is getting back to basics and build a Europe that is simple, understandable, and can decide fast and in an effective way. And this can only be done by, one, engaging national politicians in drafting legislation. We need to replace the DGs and the gigantic role of the bureaucrats in drafting legislation um, and only engaging national politicians afterwards so that they can go back in their home and then and say, ah, oh, no, it's the fault of Brussels uh, what's happening. It's not my fault. So this is number one. Secondly, this proposed legislation needs to go only one way. We cannot afford any more uh, complicated trialogues and negotiations under uh, a non-transparent framework. It needs to go to the parliament. We elect the parliament for a reason, and we elect political groups, and we set political groups for a reason. So let's give them a purpose of existence. And once the parliament, in one committee, uh, will be able to um, debate um, and amend and vote and have a common decision, then the council, uh, of course, and the member states and the heads of state can have the final word. This is a process that uh, is easy for everyone to follow. It's easy for MEPs to be more engaged. If you ask the MEPs who will get elected in May um, in this new parliament, um, if they understand the first month or two uh, what they're doing in this parliament, they will tell you, of course not. It will take them at least one year, especially for the new MEPs, to understand what exactly is the role in the parliament. So if for those it's difficult, and for the national ministers, especially those for the, of the rotating presidency, it's impossible to understand what they're doing. I asked, I don't know how many times, a national minister who was chairing a council uh, to put something on the agenda, um, to, to add something in the decisions. And he told me, I don't know how is that possible. If those are not uh, engaged, if the national MPs that you elect in your countries are not engaged, then we simply cannot ask citizens, we simply cannot ask young people to follow, uh, to follow politics, to be engaged in decisions, to understand what Europe is doing today and why it is useful for their lives. Um, so I have more things to say, but I think it's, it's better to, um, to, to, to say them during the discussion. Uh, I just, th this is my point, of course, uh, you said that the numbers are alarming, but in my opinion, numbers are not alarming, what is causing them uh, is alarming, and we, uh, we really need to change it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just to, yes, <laughs> you can, go ahead. But of course, I guess you would agree with me that a large part of employment policy is also made on a national level, where that might be a more appropriate level to also contact people about changing some things that concern the youth. Yes, this is correct. And this is uh, why we are setting now an alliance of uh, 100 uh, young MPs from EU national parliaments and non-EU national parliaments who are engaged to push national, national legislation um, and reform their employment policies. All right. Um, be before we come to questions and reflections from the audience, uh, if Mr. Andor would like to comment as some of the remarks were uh, perhaps targeted a bit not towards you personally, but maybe towards the processes of European Union and also the Commission, maybe you'd like to respond for some of the remarks you heard. Well, uh, on, uh, maybe I should come here. Yes, to sure. <coughs> I can only agree with Benedek about the importance of language. This is really a pain. Um, and uh, uh, that's um, uh, unresolved how it can be overcome. 
because obviously uh, a, a bureaucracy within itself uh, does not speak uh, the people's language, especially not in 28 uh, different um, uh, national contexts, and it is always a great effort. Uh, when we have a fantastic paper, which we think is very good, um, and then to explain uh, in, in simple terms why it is so important and why it will make um, a difference, especially when it's sometimes indeed true that you need to make a big effort in order to make small steps um, in practical uh, terms. So this is indeed, I think, something um, uh, where a lot more could be done. Um, on the other hand, as you probably know, I'm not from the EPP, um, and um, I am not um, in the business of creating illusions about uh, simplification of uh, the decision-making process. Uh, very often the process is complicated because there are different institutions according to the treaty, and, um, and uh, there are 28 countries in the European Union, and you cannot exclude anyone. You cannot have a, a process which just uh, creates ideas and then fast tracks it uh, for the benefit of uh, some kind of special interest. You did not specify what the proposal was, so it's very difficult to understand why it failed, because you did not explain what the, the concrete uh, proposal was. However, um, I am someone who has given a lot of support to Greece in the recent years, um, went twice to the Greek Parliament to discuss uh, uh, the situation and what the Commission can do. Um, however, uh, I just met too often uh, uh, this explanation that all the problems actually are found in Brussels and actually nothing in Greece. The Commission did not create the, the debt um, of uh, Greece. The Commission did not uh, create the lack of transparency um, and the very inefficient public administration, which unfortunately is a major source. Um, together with a lot of corruption in Greece, um, a lot of waste of the EU funds in the past period, unfortunately also contributed to uh, the weaknesses and the fact that Greece failed to take advantage of EU membership and Eurozone membership in the past. Without recognizing this, I don't think there is a way forward. Uh, because it's, it's, it's just too often uh, the case that national politicians say that when there is a bit of success, it's national, it's created by the national politicians. When there is failure, it's because of the EU. It's because it's in Brussels, because it's too complex in Brussels and the bureaucrats don't listen. Uh, we do listen. We follow very carefully the rules which the member states created for the EU institutions. It's not the bureaucrats who create the rules and the procedures for themselves. It's the member states who create uh, these rules, and that's the obligation and the responsibility of the bureaucrats um, uh, to follow uh, those rules. And obviously, when uh, we want to resolve a problem, we need, first of all, a fair analysis of the causes of the problem. Thank you. Uh, would you like to respond, but not to say that very briefly in the sense that I don't want you to talk at all, but just to, to leave room for other debates, I ask you to be sharp, constructive, and brief. Yes, Commissioner, I don't understand why you attack me on Greece after uh, my, um, uh, my statements on, on changing the... Uh, the system of EU decision-making. Uh, I'm the first one uh, who criticized the previous generations uh, of Greek politicians. Uh, I do it publicly and I'm the first one who recognizes that the corrupted uh, system and the huge public administration in Greece has to be reformed. It is the Samaras government, it is the EPP government that is doing the number one uh, reform program in the world with the fastest uh, reforms program ever taken uh, on this planet. It is the EPP governments that are creating now jobs in Ireland, in Portugal, that is fundamental reform, every country that is under bailout. And I don't know why uh, you chose to attack me uh, on something, that, something wrong that was happening in my country, instead of commenting on, on the fact that young, young politicians and young people don't find any interest in engaging in EU politics in the way that, the, that Europe and the Commission works today. So, of course, we can send you uh, the full presentation uh, with the full proposal of what I described. Of course, in four minutes or less, uh, it's very difficult to describe uh, how we're going to fundamentally change the EU decision-making process. But if uh, you will stand again for the Commission, of course, we can work together on that. All right. Just uh, as I am also the mediator uh, for this event, uh, I would suggest I am happy that you both have agreed that there are problems with perhaps the, the past cooperation between Greece and the European Union. Just a moment. So there is agreement.
not mutual attack. Great. Secondly, uh, I'm also happy that not only is it a chance uh, for these guys to send their presentation again, but it is also a great chance for the Commission to see it again and consider whether there are any good ideas. Uh, so, although it might seem like there's a great conflict, I'd say we're already moving forward. But a brief comment from you as well. And, oh, I'm sorry. Just to clarify that in both Greece and Ireland, there are coalition governments. It's not EPP government, but coalition governments. With the role, with, as I understand, EPP in it, right? The commissioner knows uh, who is leading the government, so I don't need to answer that. Great. So, uh, with that in mind, uh, I'm glad that this moved on. Uh, now we're going to move on to questions. Uh, as you can uh, see, just a moment, yes. Uh, I have really tried to be as fast and quick as possible, and this is not to confuse you or run around like a mad dog, but I'd ask us to keep this discussion lively and constructive. So if you talk uh, or ask questions or reflections, I ask you to think through what exactly do you want to say and put it into as constructive sentence as you can. Uh, not because I, I, I question your ability to speak or reflect, but just because there are so many of you with great ideas that we want to hear a bit more. So, who wants to present questions to, to the people? Let's uh, start from the back. Thank you very much. As I got the microphone already. Um, I, got, I have a question to all three of you. I would like to know, as the procedures for creating a list for elections is different everywhere in every party, could you let me know who, what's the sort of, what sort of group of people are deciding in your party, in your member state, on your list. So are there a lot of young people in there? What's the average age? Or what's the most common age in there? And what about women, men? So in general, diversity of the people who decide on who is going to be on the list. And as you, you said that you're just on the eighth position of, of your party's list in Croatia. So I would like to know, is there anyone young on the list, on, on the first seven ones? In your party, and what about women, men? So could you, could you say something about diversity in general? All right. Yes, thank you. So the question about the procedures uh, of the selection of candidates for European Parliament elections, well, the young people among that, who decides uh, what in your party, and are you happy with it, is perhaps something we also want to know, right? So let's start with you, and then move on to you. Uh, this time is different for Greece. Uh, we decided to change the law uh, regarding the list. So for the first time, we're going to have a preferential vote system, uh, which will allow parties to have a number double than the, the number uh, who are electable um, from the country. So Greece elects 21 MEPs. Every party will have 42 candidates. And of course, this is uh, a big number, and there is wide diversity uh, between genders. Uh, as I told Yanis uh, before, uh, the lists are being finalized, so we don't know. I cannot give you an answer right now on the diversity regarding age. And is it the general vote uh, between all party members, or is it the leaders of the party, or who, who decides? Uh, well, it's an internal discussion in every party. Uh, some parties decide uh, based uh, on, on Congress procedures. Some parties decide based on... But your party? Uh, my party, there's a committee um, from leaders of, of the party that will examine all the applications and will decide the names. And I'm going to intervene again. How many young people, or as we talked a bit about also the women, uh, would you think would be among your list of candidates, considering that you know probably the inside politics of your party quite well? I cannot answer this question. All right. So we will all be in psych excitement in to see uh, what sort of list will the EPP in Greece produce. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, in Hungary, every party has its own regulation on, on uh, creating the list. My party, um, um, at my party, the board uh, makes a proposal for the Congress, but finally the Congress elects uh, members of the uh, European list and uh, the Congress can modify freely uh, the proposal of, of the board. So uh, this is the members, uh, members who finally uh, vote about the list. Um, young people, uh, I am going to be the leader of the list if I'm a, a young politician, but <laughs> behind the second behind me is younger than me. He's um, uh, 20 
four uh, years old. Uh, most of the members of the list are under around 30, as the average age of my party membership and politicians is, is quite low. So most of our active politicians uh, are between 25 to, to 40. Um, and um, concerning the uh, female-male uh, question, uh, we have a quota. Uh, as um, one third of the membership consists of women, uh, one third of each of the national or European or other list uh, must consist of, uh, of female candidates. Uh, so um, at the, our European list, one third of the, uh, the candidates are women. All right, thank you. Yes, uh, in Croatia specifically, we have a, a procedure that depends on the legislative frame which, um, for uh, European elections, which uh, provides us only with the general provisions uh, of the European elections, such as, uh, such as uh, the uh, preferential voting system. But, uh, the quota of uh, women and the participation of young people on the lists are uh, depending only on the party leadership. Uh, and uh, specifically, the party leader who presents the, the list uh, of the pr list proposal to the main board. The main board, which I'm a member of, uh, then uh, uh, confirms or rejects that, that list. Uh, since we do not have uh, any question marks uh, regarding the Social Democratic Party uh, in Croatia, I, uh, I can say that we have uh, four out of uh, 11 uh, women candidates, and I am the only uh, young candidate on the eight positions. So it's... Uh, um, it's uh, actually not... not uh, not a good thing, if you ask me, but uh, at least we have uh, uh, some kind of a regret from the party leadership that uh, it couldn't be, uh, <laughs> it couldn't be different, and that the situation will will improve on the next uh, and upcoming parliamentary elections. So let's hope that regret turns into constructive uh, proposals and actual action from the party. Thank you for your comments. Now, a question from the first row. Um, I don't want to give away my microphone. It, I feel so powerless without it. Um, well, uh, thank you, Anna. Uh, my name is Mercida, and I'm from Albania. Actually, my question um, is directed towards the three of you. Uh, who do you feel you are representing in the European Parliament, and how much did you personally influence the decision-making process regarding the young people's concerns so far? Thank you. Mm -hmm. So maybe we start from the middle, if possible. If, if I understood well the question, um, that uh, you can say again the, the question. Yes, I, I couldn't the, the understand question exactly. was about who do you feel that you represent, uh, being uh -huh. being or becoming yeah, a yeah, member yeah. of the European Parliament, and whether you feel like you are going to influence personally the decisions involving youth. Uh, yes, so, so how far. much did you so far, but because, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, till now, as uh, I was not member of the European Parliament, I didn't have a direct uh, participation in European decision-making. Still, I was quite active as national uh, MP. I was quite active in Brussels-Hungary uh, relationship. I was uh, chair of the uh, Sustainable Development Committee of the Hungarian Parliament, and I... Uh, put a huge emphasis on uh, dealing with European questions in the national parliament, in the Hungarian parliament, as I think it's very important to, uh, to close uh, the national and, and European parliaments to each other. And we send a lot of proposals to, to the European parliament uh, uh, concerning uh, different directives and, uh, and so on. Also, I have quite an active uh, relationship with European green politics and green politicians. Uh, uh, green group of, of the European Parliament, and we part, uh, I participated in, in uh, green decision making uh, in the last couple of years. So, um, in 
indirect ways I was uh, participating in, in European politics uh, uh, till now. And as uh, my party, um, uh, most of our membership uh, are young and, and uh, um, I think we represent uh, quite clearly the, the voice of the, the young people and we tried uh, also to, to represent uh, this issue in European decision making both through uh, green uh, uh, politics and uh, through the options opened by, by being a national uh, member of the parliament. Mm -hmm. So it might be that he also represents the environment in a very cute way. Let's move on to you, sir. Uh, well, I'm, I'm not a member of the European Parliament, but I think those who are, uh, who they represent, simply it's those who uh, believe in the same policy that these MEPs are advocating for. And we have 751 MEPs, or we will have. Um, and this means that every, citizens of, every citizen of this union, every voter of this union, can have the chance to uh, push one of his representatives um, for a policy that he believes in. He can group with other citizens, uh, he can join a political party, he can join a citizen's movement, and push for a certain policy for a certain change. So every MEP should represent those who believe in it and have a plan for it. Um, your second question was, I also didn't understand it. I didn't understand his thinking. Well, this was mainly coming from the side that if you're an MEP, uh, which and how many decisions concerning youth have you personally been involved with or have impacted on? So maybe if you have done some policy making outside MEP, you can talk about that very briefly. Yeah, uh, well, as, as leader of YEP, of the Youth of EPP, I, I have uh, done a lot on, on youth policies. We have done a large campaign on job creation. Uh, we issued last week 40 proposals for small businesses. We've run a very big campaign called Low Tax Hero, calling for lower taxes uh, around Europe. Uh, the EU is the highest, and the Eurozone is the highest taxed uh, and least competitive area in the OECD, and we have to change it. Our governments are spending uh, 17 billion euros uh, every 24 hours and uh, I think uh, we, we need less taxes and more money for those who work for it. Um, uh, just uh, yesterday in Cyprus we had our council again and uh, we ran a campaign called Citizens First and we adopted a number of measures that bring, uh, that close the gap between Brussels uh, and, and the citizens um, and fix the democratic deficit. We are planning to, we, did, we run a big campaign on uh, scrapping roaming, which is finally uh, taking shape. And uh, I mean, our message to, to the young people who have a policy is that a youth of the EPP is a place that can turn their ideas into an actual reform. So um, uh, this from my end. Thank you. Uh, just a moment, uh, the last brief comment about uh, your work as you are actually an MEP. Yes. <laughs> Probably this question is, uh, is, is dedicated to, to me as a, a current uh, member of European Parliament. I believe that, um, that I represent uh, the people who voted for the, the program of socialists and democrats in the, Euro in the European Parliament and who voted for my political group, but in the same time I uh, represent young people with uh, social democratic uh, values and beliefs. Um, since uh, I, am the o I was the only young person on, on the list uh, in my country election last year, uh, I believe that I uh, got the trust from, from all the young people that, that voted for, for my list. And I uh, really uh, got that seriously and uh, I'm very, very proud to be able to uh, at least uh, vote uh, for the budget for the, in, in the European Parliament for the uh, period of 2014 to, uh, to, to 2020 where we voted the, um, the increase of the budget for Erasmus for 40%, where we voted out uh, the, the Youth Employment Initiative, Youth Guarantee. And I, I really strongly believe that we have helped uh, as um, 
I, I know that there is a problem with, with the representing of the EU, that uh, there are um, a very, very few of us in the European Parliament, but we contribute and try to contribute uh, the maximum we can. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, I see a lot of questions. I have someone waiting uh, from the go. This is from the third row. Um, just a question to all of you. I mean, obviously, you're all in campaigning mood. Um, and I would like to know, um, well, how are reactions to your campaign um, by citizens? And do you really think you reach the youth by your campaign? Mm -hmm. So, do you reach the youth by your campaign? And what have been the reactions towards your excellent campaigning so far? Let's start with you. My personal opinion is when I'm talking to the uh, to, uh, to young people is that uh, they are really aware what of what is going on in the in the European Union. But the question is whether they are they are going to uh, stay home or go out and vote uh, on uh, in the. Um, uh, on the very day of election. It is the question, and the question is how to persuade the people to actually, um, uh, to actually participate in, 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 the, in the elections. Uh, their awareness and their eagerness to, to go out and vote are not, uh, not very much balanced, uh, I, I believe so. So my campaign is all about um, uh, talking to young people whether uh, through my social media, Twitter, Facebook, uh, etc., uh, whether one-on-one, um, -on -one, uh, direct communication, um, I uh, try to emphasize as much as, uh, mu uh, as much as I can on the youth, uh, uh, youth uh, unemployment, uh, 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 the new jobs, uh, the creation of new jobs. But I have to say that. Uh, uh, my my reactions are a bit divi divided because, um, for example, at my uh, in my family, I have uh, I have a brother who holds a PhD in uh, electrical engineering, and uh, he uh, he is uh, not involved in politics, and I I simply I have so <laughs> I have been struggling with him into pers persuading him to even to even think about uh, uh, politics for a moment and to think about the, the direction uh, that the uh, EU is going to go uh, uh, towards after the election. So, so the does he have a Twitter account so that we can uh, persuade him? <laughs> yes, yes he has. You can try. <laughs> all right, so at the end of the day, we'll ask her brother's Twitter account and then we'll all tell him why he should go and vote. All right, uh, to you please. Yeah, I'm in campaign mood for two months as uh, we just finished the campaign uh, yesterday afternoon and we will start the European campaign this afternoon as I get back. Uh, <laughs> so this is a little bit of rest for me in, in, in uh, campaigning. Um, uh, in the last two months, uh, what is our experience about reaching people and, and uh, especially the youth? Uh, I think that when you are making a campaign, uh, there are different uh, measures or different tools to reach people, and uh, with different uh, uh, tools, you will reach different kind of people. So when we go to the countryside uh, organizing meetings and fora and so on, uh, most of the participants are over 40, 50. And uh, it's not easy to, uh, to invite young people to these kind of uh, uh, events. Uh, but I think um, this is because this is not the kind of activity they, they really want to, to participate. So it's very important what uh, 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 it was already mentioned that uh, to be represented in those uh, interfaces where, where young people are spending their days. So for example, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Tumblr, and so on and so on. We are very active on, on these uh, social media uh, surfaces. Also, what we think is very important to, uh, to raise the, the problems of uh, youth and to uh, what young people, in my experience, like very much is uh, the visible direct actions street movements, flash mobs, and so on. And we are quite strong in that, just 
two days ago I was hanging down from one of the bridges of, <laughs> of uh, Budapest with a huge Molino criticizing uh, the new nuclear power plant um, planned in, uh, <coughs> in Hungary and uh, my Facebook uh, was just exploding after the, uh, the actions at congratulations and so on and so on. So it's, uh, of course it's a little bit I don't know. It's, uh, so you have to uh, to be able to use the the media, um, because if I stand out and I explain uh, detailed why we oppose the new nuclear power plant, nobody will listen to to that. With one action hanging down from a, from a bridge over the Danube River, uh, with a huge molino, and uh, hundreds of thousands of people will click on your Facebook and and follow what you are doing. And you have the chance that they not just look at what you are doing, but also they try to find out why you are doing that. And uh, I think it's important that's how uh, you can reach uh, uh, young people. And also we try to involve them in the campaign. So a lot of young activists uh, are working with us and uh, we try to, uh, to find the appropriate way how we can mobilize them to mobilize uh, uh, friends and, and uh, the age group. I guess uh, this is also might be something that the far right that we discussed earlier is very good at, right? Very simple, provocative actions that people take notice. Very simple, very open communication that is sometimes difficult to answer because talking about why all people are equal takes time. Uh, however, it is very much easier to, to say something hateful, right? And maybe I don't want every one of you to engage in extreme sports, although there are a lot of bridges in Brussels, but uh, similar actions might maybe excite the politics indeed. To you. Yeah, but the only difference is that the far right is also using a little bit of violence in their... Uh, yes, and that is something uh, we shouldn't use, of course. Yes. Uh, okay, so I guess uh, this is my time to shine as rep representative of EPP. Go and ahead. I'm very happy to tell you that Jean-Claude Juncker and DPP are running the most uh, youth-focused, uh, youth-led campaign. I'll tell you why. Uh, we are the only political party that opened our political manifesto, the electoral program, uh, to the youth. We had a campaign called Up to Youth, you, where young people from all parties or non-parties or everywhere in Europe uh, could actually amend the political program, the electoral program, uh, adopted in the Dublin Congress uh, of the EPP. 42,000 uh, people under 30 years old uh, participated. This is uh, twice as big as the people who participate in the Green primary. Uh, sorry for that. And um, the, the, ten, the ten winners of this campaign came to Dublin in front of uh, the heads of state, in front of, in front of Barroso and Juncker and, and Angela Merkel, and they present their amendments. Those amendments, uh, or most of them, were adopted. Um, so this one thing, the EPP is releasing uh, this week uh, its youth manifesto with 10 points uh, only focused on the young people of Europe. This is it called 10 simple things that we want to do for the young Europeans. And uh, the most exciting part of, of the campaign will be from the 11th to the 21st of May. Uh, we are starting a road trip. Uh, it begins in four cities uh, of Europe, one in Helsinki, one in Athens, one in uh, Lisbon, and one in Sofia, and we will cover the whole of uh, continental Europe. It was quite expensive to get the bus on a plane to go to Malta and Cyprus and, and on other islands. Uh, so uh, this will be a road trip of 10 days uh, with 40 events, all with young people. Uh, our candidate will come, depending on his campaign trail as well, to most of them. We will get the messages of young people, and on the 21st uh, of May, here in Brussels, the four campaign vans will meet Jean-Claude Juncker and he t they will tell him, Mr. Candidate, uh, if you get elected as president of the commission, this is what young people want from you uh, in the next five years. Could so I just ask, you talked about this 10-point policy. Could you just say what is one thing, or bring one example of what it consists of? Jobs. All right. <laughs> That's very ambitious. Um, all right, so we have lots of questions, and I know there is this lady I have kept waiting, which I apologize for, and she is right there. Uh, could you please pass the microphone? I know, I will get to you and I will try to force people to be even more brief. Okay, hello. Um, I'm Anna Krozer, also coming from Hungary. You slightly killed my question with the far right, but I'm going to ask it anyway. So, uh, in light of especially uh, the, the fact that uh, extreme forces are increasing their, their support among young people, uh, while all the other ones are just 
mainly sustaining it. Um, I would like to ask this um, probably slightly provocative question. Uh, what are they doing right? <laughs> and what are you doing wrong? Uh, what can you do better in terms of uh, addressing issues? Are they communicating better? Is it the language they are using? Is it actions? Are they using media better? Um, so could you just comment on that? All right, and just to keep focus, maybe we focus on what is something we could learn from them. Actually, that is, would be good for us. And let's not focus on what they do wrong, because I think we all know that, right? Uh, just not that I don't like the question, it's just we have so many others. So is there anything that you could learn from the campaigns of the far right, and what would that be? If I can uh, take the floor first, uh, I personally, if you ask me, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do anything the same as the, the far right uh, parties because I do not think that it's the right time for populism. Uh, there are some uh, really hard decisions to communicate and really hard decisions to take. It's not, uh, you, you should um, be aware that it's not the uh, the best time in the world for the European Union, for the uh, for the global economic system, uh, um, and uh, the populist messages cannot help here. As a, rep a responsible politicians, I wouldn't uh, wouldn't go to populism. So, so you would say the reason they are successful is because they're they're populist. Yeah. All right. Basically, that's it. Mm -hmm. I, I see the, the question a little bit more complicated. Of course, this is a very important aspect of the, uh, the issue. Um, the question, I think, is not if we should learn something from the extreme right, but to understand why they are uh, popular. And, and uh, populism is one of uh, uh, the answers. But I think we have to realize that, uh, especially since uh, the crisis, uh, there are huge tensions in our societies. And uh, the uh, mainstream political uh, parties or forces um, were not able to, to give convincing answers for a lot of questions raised by the uh, crisis. Why the extreme right made the impression for a lot of people that they have some kind of answer. I don't understand at all, and I think none of us understand at all the, the answers. But they were able to, to make the impression that they are not hiding behind uh, bureaucratic um, chatting and talking, but they just look in the core of the problems, they speak about that, and they, they have the uh, answer for that. And I think we have to realize that, uh, that there are these tensions and problems in, in society. And we were not able to, uh, to make an interface between the, the mainstream political forces or democratic political forces and those anger in, in society. Let's, uh, uh, Mr. Andor mentioned the Indignados uh, movement, but we could speak about uh, the Occupy Wall Street movement in the US or the globalization critical movement around the millennium. Um, there is a, a, a strong feeling and wide feeling uh, in, in our societies that the existing system is not helping the everyday life, is not giving an answer to the uh, problems. And if we don't find a way how to um, canalize this frustration, this anger, uh, this fear into democratic political movements and actions, they will find their way to non-democratic uh, political movement. Let's see what happened with the indignados. Where are the indignados? But Nowhere. So Where uh, is the Occupy Wall Street movement? Nowhere. Where are the globalization critical movements of the uh, years of the 2000s? Nowhere. And the democratic uh, political parties, and this is a criticism against ourselves as well, uh, for, for Greens, were not able to uh, to help them, to include them, to give answer, to give uh, floor uh, to this uh, uh, existing fear and anger, and to explain that those simple, bad, and uh, critical answers which is made by the extreme right are not the right answers, and we have 
better answers uh, for that. So I think if we have to do something, is find uh, better answers for those uh, fears and, and frustration of, of, of the society, because the crisis is not over. And the anger and the frustration is still there. And if we, we don't do that, extreme right will raise and come up uh, uh, in the future as well. To move on from that, just Konstantinos, uh, as I know you come from a country that also has quite a painful experience, would you feel and would you agree with me that sometimes we debate too little with the far right, making it seem like they win their arguments by us just being quiet because we think they're so ridiculous? No, I disagree with you. I actually agree with Sandra on this one. Uh, they are doing nothing right to answer your question uh, and what we're doing wrong is giving them attention and uh, the simple uh, relation between the growth of the extremes both on the right and the left um, uh, in relation to what happens in a country is that simply when things go well and when the governments are doing their jobs and uh, citizens are prosperous uh, the extremes are low and when things are very bad and we are in a crisis the extremes are rising. So this is the only thing we have to do, do our job uh, when in government, create jobs for young people and for citizens in general, and make our societies prosperous. This is the only thing that we can so do. So you would say that if in some countries such far right or far left movements gain about 20% support or even 15% support, we should still continue ignoring the far right and its party um, uh, ideology? We are not ignoring them. The media are uh, spending much of their 8 o'clock news uh, on what the far right is doing. If it's beating a, uh, an immigrant or, or killing someone uh, or doing something extreme or populist or whatever, they are giving them their attention. And, and citizens, where they are when they feel bad about their lives, when they feel that their government is not serving them, when they feel that their politicians are not representing them, they turn their back. It's not that 15% or actually now 8% uh, uh, of, of the Greek people are believing in Nazi ideas. It's not that. It's that they are simply disappointed with the political system and they want a change. So the media is, is, is talking about them. People care about them. Actions happen that take attention, meaning that people do have some sympathy towards that ideology or just towards that communication. And you say that the correct answer would be to ignore them. Why? When we are not ignoring them, they are growing. When we are ignoring them, they are not growing. Is that clear? <laughs> it is not clear, but we can move on. Um, so we have some questions for that from that gentleman. Thank you very much. My name is Andrei Konstantin. I'm originally from Romania. And I have a question, and it's going to be a personal problem for me as well. I'm a young person, EU citizen. I want to vote, but every single member state has a different registration date for when it comes to voting in the European elections. I'm not talking about the local or national. I'm talking about that I'm a Rom Romanian citizen. I'm in Belgium. The registration date has passed. I can't vote in the European elections. During the European elections, I'm going to be in Lithuania. I won't be able to register in that country as well. I won't be able to exercise my writing vote. Even if I would be able to go to my own embassy for to vote, maybe I'm not in that city where the embassy is. Maybe I'm not in the capital. Could you please elaborate and tell us your opinion about this difference and about this impediment? And it's not only for the young generation. It's about the business people who travel from one corner of the EU to the other. It's about the tourists who are on holiday during that period when the voting happens. This is not only about the young people. This is a problem for any EU citizen. Thank you. Thank you. I will use this chance to very uh, arrogantly ad advertise Estonian election system as we vote online, meaning that I can be in Brussels and still vote in Tallinn with my ID card. But leaving that solution aside, if you don't like the internet, uh, moving on to your ideas on how we could, is it a problem and how we could solve this? Uh, yeah, I, I don't think today this is a problem in most of the countries. Uh, Obviously not all of them, but in the large majority people can vote at home or abroad through their embassies or uh, online or they can register in another country uh, and vote. Uh, if in Romania this is not possible, this is unacceptable and you should definitely attack the socialist government in Romania. So address your uh, question to this person on the panel. All right, so uh, political action was advised by, by Konstantinos. To you, sir? 
Uh, yes, uh, there are different regulations in the EU member states. Um, 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 in Hungary, a conservative government made it very difficult to vote abroad. So please mention to your uh, <laughs> colleagues, uh, uh, conservative colleagues in the Hungarian government. <coughs> Uh, it's a problem in Hungary as well. Uh, um, that um, um, uh, not only the European election but also the national elections, uh, it's it's very hard to uh, to uh, vote uh, for those who are staying abroad during the elections. What I would propose is the Estonian uh, example. I, Thank I, you. I believe deeply in in uh, electronic democracy, so I think we should. Um, develop um, those kind of uh, measures which help uh, the people to, to use uh, um, electronic democratic measures. Yes, and unfortunately in your case uh, we can see very well how mobility on, on one hand can be a, 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 tremendous, uh, a tremendous thing for, for lives of, uh, and jobs of young people and in the, in the second uh, case it can be an obstacle in order to uh, uh, to vote and to participate in the, this uh, democratic event uh, in May. Uh, definitely I would advise you to contact me, maybe I can connect you with some uh, SND members from, from Romania in the European Parliament, we can, we can see what can be done, but if you say nothing can be done, uh, I, I don't know, uh, it really is, it's a question of the national uh, uh, regulations on, on the elections. Uh, in Croatia we do not have these problems because we are a country of four million people and it's really uh, not a problem to set, uh, set <laughs> the votes and to, um, to um, make, make it easier for uh, every citizen so to fulfill their obligation. but. Uh, in spite of this fact, we have a really long ter low turnout. Uh, last year we had uh, only 20% of uh, the voters coming out uh, on the election. Yeah, so I can also suggest uh, to, to come to Estonia. We have Skype and TransferWise, so, and elections, it's great. Uh, but we have cold winters, which is sad. Um, we have time for one last question, and there was a gentleman in the waiting, so I... I apologize for everyone who is raising their hands and looking at me a bit angrily. Uh, Andrea? Yeah, you can go right now. So this question is for Mr. Kiranakis and Mrs. Petrovic. You have both chosen to pursue poli a political career, and the emphasis here is on career, at an early age. What do you think about this professionalization of politics and its consequent separation from everyday life? Yeah. Easy one. Really easy. Uh, uh, first of all, um, I would I would like to emphasize that um, I'm probably going to uh, going to leave politics uh, in uh, after after the elections in May. So the professionalization of politics doesn't uh, doesn't refer to me at anymore. Uh, the the reason why I uh, became involved in politics is the is the uh, situation in my country in 2000 in the beginning of 2000. So 10 years ago, uh, my uh, my country was considered to be the most corrupted in the in the in this part of Europe, and uh, not many people, young people, were involved in politics, and that. Uh, that uh, the situation for young people was uh, really devastating in, the, in these times. Nowadays, uh, the situation has uh, improved a bit, but not uh, not uh, not enough, if you ask me. Uh, I will continue to encourage young people to um, to become involved and to stay in politics, to be uh, to be persistent and be, to be pursuant uh, to the political uh, political leadership of their parties uh, because I believe that um, in future the question of having young candidates on the on the list uh, for the elections uh, should be a question a question of um, of a prestige thank you uh, yes, um, my friend, uh, you're very wrong on this one, at least uh, on me. Uh, I'm doing, uh, I'm leading UCPP in my free time. I'm actually a digital entrepreneur. 
I, I founded uh, a business uh, before finishing uh, my studies, and uh, I'm not getting paid. So uh, I don't I don't know how you have uh, the word career in your mind, but it's definitely not one. Um, uh, but regarding those uh, in politics who choose uh, to have um, a professional career in politics, uh, there's actually a very good answer uh, coming from Christopher Fjellner, who is a Swedish MEP uh, from the Moderate Party, uh, so a member of the EPP group. And he said that in order to uh, bridge this gap between um, career politicians and everyday problems, every politician should live the life of an entrepreneur for at least two months. And I can confirm that by saying that also in our organization, the debates we're having in the youth of the EPP, there is a large difference between those who work in the private sector and they have an actual contact with real problems, you know, paying their taxes, queuing for bureaucratic procedures, um, having difficulties to hire someone or fire someone, uh, and those who work, for example, in a political party or those who work, for example, in a public administration. So I think every politician and perhaps every MEP of the next parliament should go through a training program and become um, an entrepreneur or a private sector employee uh, for a part of his time to understand what are the real everyday problems of the citizens. However, would you agree that a professional politician might also understand those problems, for example, if he keeps close contact with his, con his or her constituents? I think experience shows the opposite. Uh, of course, there are exceptions, uh, but the general rule is that uh, if someone who lived the life uh, and got young, got into politics when young, and you know, throughout all his life he's just a politician, uh, it's very difficult for him or her to understand uh, those real problems. I think that even for a small part of your life, you need to go through that experience in the private sector and experience what it means uh, to deal with problems that when you are in politics you cannot uh, because you have every of your problems solved uh, by public money. All right, moving on. Well, I was not directly addressed. Because I know you, you worked. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I spent 10 years in, in the NGO, NGO sector and I uh, taught uh, at university and I had um, a small family company so I experienced different, not only the, the entrepreneur sector but also the NGO sector and, and the public uh, sector before going to politics. Right, but I, I must find that I, I somehow find it bizarre, or even I'm sad, that our idea of professional politicians is sad, is, is negative, is saying that it's something bad. Um, but we are almost out of time, so I'm not going to accept more questions from the audience, and I apologize for it, as, as we have promised that this event will take place during this time. However, we would like to uh, finish with a good round on a bit more specific policies. So... We have heard a lot of discussions, perspectives, dialogue. Now it is the time when the European Parliament that we today here might even simulate, uh, it's time to vote. And uh, in order to ease this process, I have for the each uh, panelist a green and a red sheet, which indicate the green yes and the red, of course, no. And while we know that in the... <laughs> we'll get to that, don't worry. It's not something to be afraid of. I know that in the normal procedure you can also abstain, but in this room, in our small little simulation, you can't. It's yes or no, and of course we won't hold you up to your word, meaning that if you think for now something is something you want to say yes to, you won't have to defend it in later elections if you change your mind. That's all right, right? But we just want to know how do you feel about few specific proposals that have been put uh, uh, some ideas that have been put forward to help liven the youth participation. And to help me with these uh, is, is a PhD candidate on European studies uh, from the London School of Economics, Chris. And, and he will ask you about whether you support a specific policy or not. And then you can indicate with a green card, yes, or with a red card, no. And, yes. So I'm going to give the mic to Chris. Yeah, just to add, um, yeah, you just have to imagine you're all MEPs now, it's September. <laughs> of course, you're all young, so you're totally hangover, come into the parliament, don't know what they vote on, and you just get like 
one sentence, and now all the people are looking at you, what are you doing? And so you can't ask any questions, you just have to say yes or no. So you're late that's, for the party. That's basically the point. So um, there, there is a bill on European parties should present Europe-wide candidate lists for the EP elections. So yes Europe, or no? Yeah, so Europe-wide candidate lists. Okay. All right, thank you. We have this. Uh, then um, the EU will establish and fund a youth ombudsman office that uh, will defend the rights of young people um, especially with regard to the labor market, and issue reports on the state of the youth in the union. Okay. All right, thank you. And the last one, national parties are obliged um, to implement compulsory youth quota for their lists to the EP elections. Compulsory youth quota. <laughs> All right, thank okay. you. That was very interesting. Um, I, well, I would like to follow up on that, but as uh, we are running a bit out of time, I would suggest that, uh, because after we have presented uh, another great way to increase youth participation to you, and summed up this event, you will have a chance to have lunch here with us, and I suggest you take it. Then you can ask these guys some questions, as uh, at least two of them are campaigning, and they are, uh, well, not directly for your votes, but their parties. So uh, you can ask them about why they did not support the youth ombudsman uh, and, and other things, all right? But I would now like to, to give word back to, back to Janis, uh, who will speak Thank about you. a tool that we can use to persuade youth and give the youth some direction on how they should vote uh, on EP elections in their countries. I hope that uh, the three of you will stay for the light lunch because some of the reds and the, and the green cards, I was asking myself, why did you say yes or no? <laughs> so I'm looking forward to discussing with you. But that just gave a taste about certain questions which are out there. These were more specific with respect to the youth. Um, but um, there are other tools. And there's one tool which I, we want to use in the final minute of the, this event um, to indicate to you which is out there, which is called My, Watch, uh, My Vote 2014. And what it tries to do uh, is um, to uh, give you on the internet, I know it's going to be difficult from the back to see it, um, give you on the uh, wire web the opportunity to uh, cast your vote and to see what, which MEPs, which parties share your, vote, uh, share your views. So you get individual questions like should academic standards be harmonized through the EU, should government investments and jobs for young people be exempted from rules of budget deficits. It's 15 questions which are being asked and uh, certain of these questions are also rather complicated like um, should you provide more support for the development of poor EU regions so they give explanations of what that would mean, what is behind that to, in order to help you um, to understand what the question is about for those who are not able to understand the question immediately um, and they also give for certain questions some arguments in favor or against so that you can make up your opinion in the end give answers to these 15 questions and they've asked MEPs the same questions and you will see who of them shares your views with respect to these 15 questions which were addressed um, in this case by the way a Greek who is number one for the guy who answered this question of this person um, and you can also see which of the parties um, correlates with your answers and I think this is a good tool in order for people to um, make up their mind what to vote if you can get them to go and cast their ballot, uh, their ballot in the for, for starting. And I think today's event was a good way of getting people persuaded to go and vote. Um, this was streamlined so I do not know how many people watched uh, this event but I think that the three of you did a very good job in uh, in uh, trying to convince, not only uh, by saying that there's a need to get more involved to young people, but to what you're doing and how you're doing it to get people to uh, be more involved in uh, European politics. Yeah, I just wanted to say when your brother again says, for example, I can't go to vote because I don't know who to vote for, you have this tool to say you're out of an excuse, right? Mm -hmm. All right. So there is even another tool. Great. There is competition between great democracy tools. It's the same. It's the same, same one. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right. So I have the honor of finishing this, and uh, I would like to say I am actually quite surprised 
that the feelings I got from here were rather negative or even pessimistic about the involvement of youth in current European affairs. And while, as I said, I am as optimist as it gets, I don't think that this should be a time where we despair and time where we say that future generations will not participate in European politics. And I think that, the, that <laughs> there are a few problems that I would like to point out that I find interesting. The first is, although we would agree that there are some politicians that we do not consider so honorable, the demonization of politics is wrong and it is a simplified logic of how our political processes work, right? All of us know politicians who are great at what they do. All of us know politicians that we like, that we vote for, and even if we don't vote for, we really respect them. Do you agree? Yes, okay. <laughs> no, we heard as well. Uh, then we will debate later, all right? Secondly, even if there are a majority of politicians that are bad, I believe personally that it is the problem that, for example, young future labbers, who I've seen here, the majority of them are not politicians. A majority of them are not pursuing a political career, although they probably would be rather suitable for it, right? They're educated, they're very concerned, very active, very balanced, with very balanced and in intricate ideas about Europe. But why is it that the best of the best of our societies do not want to go into politics, but want to be someone else? And they say, oh, politics, that's not for me. And I'd say we should focus more on trying to get better people into politics, as it is important because they make the most important decisions, right? The future of Europe is at stake, whether we can manage to be innovative or whether we fall through the cracks. And we need best people to make those decisions, and as you said, we need more experiences, but we still need to get experts into politics as well. And thus, my suggestion to you guys is, my experience being an Estonian who also we do not have such high rates, even with our elections, apparently people still don't find elections exciting, is we should do something. Let's go to universities and speak to people about why elections are important. Let's try to, in a very friendly manner, of course, argue and discuss with people why they do not vote in elections and make sure that they do go. Even if, I don't know, they ruined the ballot or something like that. But it's important to participate and take part. Make it a family ritual, right? Take your parents, your aunts and, and, and uncles and go together and later on have a coffee or tea. Right? Because voting is very, very important. And the last thing I heard from here today was that it is somehow the... <laughs> I got this idea that somehow even the youth is, is at, at fault. And it's not completely true, but people were saying it's the responsibility of the youth to get involved. And while I agree, let's be honest, it is a collective fail if we do not work to get other youth into politics and at least to vote. Right? So even if it is someone's fault, we still have an obligation to change something. Otherwise, you know, the politics is going to, sorry for saying this uh, very honestly, still going to suck and going to suck even further. And that means we're not going to get those processes out of the crisis that we really need. So go to schools, go to universities, speak to your friends and take your family to vote. Even if you ruined the ballot or you, you don't know who to vote for, this is what the tool is for. And last but not least, please stay here to have lunch and also to discuss with either future labbers, among yourself, me, why I didn't take your questions, or with those lovely candidates. All right? I hope you will have a great, great time. And also, I hope you will go and vote. And I hope you'll have lovely election period. Thank you. Let me... <laughs> Let me... Let me just say a final words of thanks. Thanks to all of you for being here, for sharing your time with us, discussing with us. Thanks to all the panelists for coming here, to sharing your ideas with us. Thanks also to Mr. Ander, who has already left. Thanks to all the future labbers who made this possible with their ideas. And uh, I think that what we did, the two of us, what we tried to do is to showcase that we need to get the youth more involved than the elderly. This is why the guy with the increasingly wide beard said less, and she said more. And I want you all to thank Anna for her moderation. Thank you.